record on this computer. Uh, so that is recording now. Thanks a lot, Dylan, for reminding me. Um, all right, so <clears throat> the first clinical situation that we're gonna talk about is um, medial shoulder instability. <clears throat> and medial shoulder instability is arguably the most common cause of lameness in mature dogs. Um, uh, a, a most common cause of forelimb lameness in mature dogs. I'll clarify that. Obviously, cruciate disease is more common. Um, but um, uh, medial shoulder instability is actually more common in mature dogs than elbow dysplasia. And it's, it's one of the most difficult to diagnose and, um, and most difficult to confirm. And it's also not that easy to treat in primary care practice. So it often gets missed if you're not looking for it. So <clears throat> just to review the anatomy a little bit, looking from the lateral side, We've got the, the medial uh, glenohumeral ligament or medial collateral ligament, which is kind of a Y or V-shaped structure. <clears throat> and then we've got the subscapularis tendon, which is out here cranially. And then uh, laterally, or looking from the medial side to the lateral side, we've got the uh, medial, or sorry, the lateral collateral ligament or lateral glenohumeral ligament. And then this is the biceps tendon, which originates on the supraglenoid tubercle comes down through the biceps bursa and extends and then attaches to the proximal radius. So that's the anatomy that we're talking about here. And then adding a little bit of, um, of muscular anatomy, we've got the uh, bursa here with the biceps uh, brachii. Um, and then we've got the subscapularis, which makes up the subscapularis tendon within the joint. Now, <clears throat> it's most common in large and active dogs. It can occur in smaller breed dogs, but usually, typically, it's large, very active dogs that um, run around in the park chasing tennis balls and that kind of thing. And it's a repetitive stress injury, which causes stretching of the ligaments and the capsule. Um, the uh, typical behavior that results in this is weaving back and forth, um, as in chasing a tennis ball or almost like when you do um, agility and they're running between the flags, kind of between the cones and running back and forth, or if they jump up and land with the leg in abduction, that's gonna put stress on that medial collateral ligament. And you're going to get stretching of the ligament in the capsule. Um, you um, lose the glenohumeral balance, um, which results in degenerative joint disease. And so that's kind of the passive physiology of this condition. Um, there's a uh, spectrum of disease with these guys from mild all the way to severe, as would be the case with, you know, with anything else. And with mild uh, disease, either they refuse exercise or after um, uh, a moderate amount of exercise, they limp a little bit. Um, they then have progressive lameness as they get more severe. And this is really, really common. I mean, if you are not looking out for this, you will miss it. But once you start having this on your radar, you will pick up medial glenohumeral ligament uh, instability and disease very, very frequently. So all of these are gonna have pain um, with manipulation and that's going to be on abduction of the leg or hyperextension or hypoflexion or all three. Um, and then the more severe conditions will actually have some palpable instability characterized by an increased angle of abduction, which we will go over um, soon. So the diagnosis, the most important part of the diagnosis is um, history and physical. Um, and again, it's going to be typically large breed dogs that are very active and that get progressively lame, particularly after exercise, and then usually improve with rest. Now we're going to take radiographs, but unfortunately you can't diagnose this radiographically and often you don't see anything radiographically. You might see a bit of degenerative joint disease characterized by a little osteophyte back here or back here. Sometimes incidentally, you'll see, um, you will see calcification of the suprascapular tendon um, or the biceps tendon, but that's, that's not what's causing the problem. The problem is damage to the, the medial glenohumeral ligament subscapularis tendon, which you can only see arthroscopically. Um, you can try to do ultrasound and MRI. We have not had a lot of luck with that, although I, and, and the problem, I guess, is that it's so user dependent um, uh, based on interpretation of the ultrasound and on the MRI. So that's not part of our standard diagnostic test. Basically, if we see a dog that has typical history 
and we get pain on hyperflexion, hyperextension, and abduction, we're going to, uh, particularly if it's more severe, we're going to scope that dog um, and confirm the diagnosis. But um, in your primary care practice, if you don't have access to arthroscopy, if you have a dog that has pain on hyperflexion, hyperextension, and abduction of the joint, and does not have radiographic signs of osteosarcoma, I would assume that it's medial hemoligament ligament instability. And if you think about cases that present to you like that, how many of those have you possibly missed um, not recognizing this as a disease? Um, I barely recognized it as a disease before we started doing shoulder arthroscopy. Um, so on physical examination, we're going we to see- If we could get him, you know, I know he's still lame. If we could get him like this, So he's limping on the right forelimb. One thing that's really helpful is if you um, use your iPhone or whatever phone you have and video them in slow motion, and you're gonna really see that head bob. Like on most of your iPhones now, you can record up to about 240 frames per second. And when you really slow it down, you see that foot touching the ground. Um, when you see the foot touching the ground, you'll see the head come up. So the head's down on the left. And so down on the left and up on the right. See how it just came up just like a little bit. So this is on the left-hand side, it's down. And on the right-hand side, the head comes up. So that is a subtle lameness. Can you guys see that? Thumbs up if you can see that head come up on the, on the right forelimb. So I can't... Um, uh, recommend enough that you get your phone out and video these guys from the front, the back, both sides in slow motion, and then um, uh, and then really slow it down, and you can really see that lameness much more clearly than you can watching it grossly. Um, there's a question from Robert: Will you get muscle shoulder at shoulder muscle atrophy? You can, but it's not absolutely reliable to uh, test. So. Um, so again, we're looking for thoracic limb lameness. We're obviously going to check the elbow to see if there's pain on flexion and extension. You can take radiographs, but remember, even if you see osteoarthritis in the elbow joint, there's a saying, just because you have diarrhea doesn't mean you can't have a headache. Okay, and so if we, um, even if you definitively have elbow arthritis, definitely check that shoulder to see if you have pain on hyperflexion, hyperextension, and abduction. So. Uh, muscle atrophy, again, is a possibility. We're looking at flexion and it's extension. The biceps test, I'm not sure if I have a video of that, but basically what we're doing is we are hyperflexing the shoulder joint while extending the elbow. And so that's going to put a lot of tension on the biceps bursa and the biceps tendon, and then you're going to push on that biceps with your thumb. And if that causes a lot of pain, that's a positive biceps test. I'll talk to you about abduction angle and drawer testing in a minute. Um, and remember that, that there's a challenge between isolating the elbow and, or, or isolation of the elbow and shoulder joints when you're doing range of motion and that kind of thing. But just keep your, keep your awareness up and your radar on looking for, um, for shoulder lameness and shoulder pain in these dogs. So um, there was one study that showed that physical examina examinations were limited in their ability to predict the type of arthroscopic pathology, including abduction tests, biceps tests, cranial caudal drawer, and medial lateral drawer. But basically what we're looking for is pain in the shoulder joint. Um, and that's probably the most reliable diagnostic test. So if you have pain in the shoulder joint in the absence of obvious osteosarcoma, the um, very, very common diagnosis is going to be medial shoulder instability. You may also have biceps tenosynovitis as well. And so it's good to do that biceps test to make sure that the majority of the, the pain isn't coming from the biceps muscle or the biceps tendon. All right, so this is the biceps test here. So we are extending the elbow while flexing the shoulder and then pushing on the biceps um, and that, that biceps tendon. And if you get a lot of pain there, that's consistent with biceps tenosynovitis. All right, and then you can check for drawer of the shoulder joint, just like you can check for drawer in the stifle joint. And so up here is, is dorsal, 
This is ventral. And what we're doing is we're grabbing onto the acromion and the front of the supraglenoid tubercle, and then grabbing onto the caudal kind of greater tubercle and the cranial greater tubercle. And we're gonna slide that back and forth, just like you would a stifle checking for cruciate disease. And um, that is a um, really good indicator of, um, of shoulder instability. Any questions about that? And then uh, there's a question about specific age for the disease. Usually we see it kind of five years of age and older, um, but you can see it at any age. So we're checking for cranial and caudal drawer, medial lateral drawer. Um, sometimes it's difficult to perform and palpate the landmarks um, and it can be limited with subtle disease, but it's definitely something worth checking for and, and check it on all your normal patients under anesthesia, start doing that today. Um, and seeing what normal is so that you'll be able to pick up abnormal when you, know, when you see it. Let's see what's going on here. Okay, um, the other thing that you can do is check for abduction angle. And so what we're doing here is that we're keeping the scapula horizontal and then we're going to push the scapula down to mobilize it and we're going to try to abduct the shoulder joint. And normal is about 30 degrees. So this would be a normal case affected patients are up to or greater than 50 degrees. Um, you can have laxity with other causes of lameness. There are breed and individual differences and it's inaccurate with mild laxity, but basically what you should do is compare one side with the other side. Um, and that's gonna be your most, you know, your most valuable diagnostic test. Um, again, that does not definitively tell you that you have medial glenohumeral ligament instability, but it will increase your index of suspicion. And I have, I've had some that you can basically bend out at about 90 degrees, um, uh, indicating really severe damage to those structures. I also had another dog where I was palpating for angle of abduction. I got about 30 degrees, suddenly I got a pop, and then I got about 70 degrees. And so, um, and that's, that's, uh, was a great diagnostic test for me because I knew what the problem was. And I can tell you for sure that a normal ligament, I would not be able to pop like that. So that was probably about three strands away from popping completely on its own. Okay, uh, there's a question about, will you palpate medial thickening of the, uh, of the joint capsule in these dogs? Generally not, it's not something that I usually pick up. And then to do these tests, yeah, definitely a sedated orthopedic exam is a good idea. Uh, when we take radiographs, we're basically just trying to rule out other conditions, OCD, which is going to be characterized by a little um, uh, subchondral bone defect back here on the humeral head. We're going to look for osteosarcoma, which is going to be metaphyseal up here proximally with lysis and uh, bony proliferation. We're going to look for fractures, things like that. We're also looking for secondary osteoarthritis. And so this is a spur back here coming off the caudal humeral, uh, sorry, the caudal glenoid and then another spur off it coming off the caudal humeral head. Um, this dog is probably quite small just based on the radiographic appearance and the curvature of the humerus, but this, uh, it, you can't rule it out just because it's a smaller dog. Remember that we can't see soft tissues and it's not clinically useful for detecting so shoulder pathology. So basically what we're doing is just ruling out other conditions that would be causing a shoulder lameness. Um, and so there's a question is, biceps positive test, biceps tenosynovitis or medial shoulder instability? That's a good question. You can get um, positive biceps test in general medial shoulder instability, but usually it's gonna be more severe in dogs with biceps tenosynovitis. So, and the other thing is, again, you can have both kinds of pathology going on at the same time in the joint. Okay, so these are arthroscopic um, images coming from the lateral side, looking at the medial, uh, medial compartment of the shoulder joint. And so this is just very mild uh, uh, instability. And that's the subscapularis tendon there that just has a little bit of fibrillation. This is one that's fairly severe. This is again, the subscapularis tendon. That's the, uh, by, uh, the medial glenohumeral ligament up here, this big white structure, and that subscapularis tendon down here. Um, and then this is one that's very severe, so we can see complete disruption of that subscapularis tendon character. It looks almost like a mump um, uh, with the number of ruptured fibers. Uh, if a dog is one-year-old, then what's your top differential diagnosis? 
I would say probably OCD. Um, if I've got a year old dog, large breed or giant breed dog that comes in with a shoulder lameness, um, uh, OCD would be my number one differential, but you should be able to see that radiographically pretty clearly. Medial shoulder instability um, would be uncommon in a dog of that age. I'm not gonna say it's impossible, but it would be less likely. So this is arthroscopy of a joint. You can see that this is the biceps tendon right here. You can see it clear as day going down into that biceps bursa and then heading caudally, that subscapularis tendon right there. And then on top, that's the medial glenohumeral ligament, that Y-shaped structure right there. So we're coming around caudally around the back of the humeral head, getting a probe in, and we are um, probing that subscapularis tendon and we're looking for disruption in the fibers. And this is a mildly affected dog. Okay, and I know that you guys aren't gonna be doing arthroscopy, but just to, I'm showing you these just to demonstrate that pathology in there. And this is not something that you can see surgically without an arthroscope. So there's not an open procedure that you can do that's gonna give you this visualization or any kind of visualization of these structures. So most of this is going to be, you know, if you've got an arthroscope and you're comfortable scoping the shoulder joint, great. But if you're not, it's gonna be purely a clinical diagnosis. Now in this dog, we just did radiofrequency ablation of the joint capsule. Um, and so I've got this little radiofrequency probe and I'm going in and I'm burning the joint capsule and the idea that it's gonna scar down. This is probably more voodoo than anything. Um, I've stopped doing these. Um, there's also the risk that you're raising the temperature of the joint fluid to like 50, 60 degrees Celsius, which could cause damage to the chondrocytes. So I would not do, um, I would not do radiofrequency um, ablation of the, the joint capsule in these patients anymore. All right, so this is moderate disease. So that's the subscapularis tendon right there. You can see that that's pretty well frayed. That's biceps tendon there, coming back, uh, sorry, biceps tendon there, and then coming back to, so looking down in the bursa, that biceps tendon looks completely normal and healthy. Coming back, that subscapularis tendon there, that's the medial joint capsule, subscapularis tendon there, which is frayed, but the, you see the collateral ligament is actually fairly intact. Coming around the caudal humeral head, um, looking in that caudal sulcus of the joint capsule. Um, I will note that um, arthroscopy of the shoulder joint is one of the more challenging joints to get into. Um, and so if you're doing arthroscopy or thinking about starting doing arthroscopy, it's probably not the joint that I would start with. Um, that's a, a challenging one to get into. All right, and then this is one that's very severe. That's biceps tendon up there. That subscapularis tendon is completely trashed and you can see the same with the collateral ligament. So there's basically um, no collateral ligament there. We've got all the synovial proliferation. Uh, all, that's just a very nasty looking joint. Basically, we've got no collateral ligament left there at all. This is a probe within the joint. Um, palpating that rupture, that completely ruptured subscapularis tendon. So pretty dramatic um, pathology there. Okay, any questions about that? All right, so going forward, mild cases can be treated with um, medical management rehabilitation. Moderate to severe cases need surgical management. And by surgery, we usually mean arthroscopy. Could you do a medial shoulder ligament replacement without arthroscopy, you could, but I'd be concerned about uh, just confirming my diagnosis with a scope before, uh, before I did that surgery. If you have MRI or ultrasound and you have somebody that's, that's comfortable making a diagnosis based on, based on MRI and ultrasound, you could do a medial shoulder ligament replacement without arthroscopy. I, I would not be comfortable with that because I would feel like I really need to look at that to make a diagnosis, but mild cases, you can manage these medically. And so what is um, medical management for these guys? Uh, there's a question about, um, do I prefer PRP for mild cases? So PRP or stem cells would be completely reasonable for mild cases in combination with other medical management. And that's gonna be non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, physiotherapy and hobbles. And hobbles are uh, there's a company called Dog Legs. Can you give me a thumbs up if you are familiar with Dog Legs? Um, Dog Legs is a company in, I think it's in Reston, Virginia, and they make these, these um, 
straps that are basically Velcroed on the dog and they keep the dog from abducting its front legs. Um, I worked with the, the owner of that company when I lived in Virginia about developing some of these products. Um, and so I think it's D-O-G-G-L-E-G-G-S dot com. Um, and they provide these hobbles and they're, they're quite effective for this condition. Um, so these are what the hobbles look like. These are from dog legs. And you can either um, take measurements of the dog and order them one at a time, or you can order a few different sizes and then adjust them with Velcro. Um, we do exercise restriction. And if you guys wanna take a screenshot of this or take a photo with your phone, this is the majority of the medical management. So exercise restriction for eight to 12 weeks. Hobbles are helpful, not absolutely critical. Non-steroidals is required. Um, uh, and then this is uh, for mild to moderate signs and you can have recurrence of clinical signs. Um, the, the, the issue is the main thing here is that even if you can't treat these surgically, when you're diagnosing four limb lameness, you don't wanna miss this diagnosis, the diagnosis and think you're treating elbow dysplasia and find out you're treating the wrong thing the whole time. Um, and so it's just gonna increase your, I guess your therapeutic index um, for these cases, if you know that you're, you know, if you didn't realize you're treating the wrong condition, you wouldn't know that you were failing. Um, but, but if you accurately diagnose it, um, at least you'll know what you're treating or why the treatment that you're providing isn't working. Um, physiotherapy. Um, so um, we're going to protect from further injury. Um, Non-steroidals. Uh, there's a question on the chat room in non-steroidals for how long? Um, generally, we use them probably for a month to start with and then as needed after that. Um, and so if you have recurrence of, of clinical signs. Um, regarding physiotherapy, you just want to be really careful that you're not going to, um, uh, that you're not going to do more damage. We're going to increase the strength and proprioception. We're going to avoid uh, atrophy and maintain an improved range of motion. Um, bandage technology that you could use if you didn't have hobbles, I suppose that you could fashion something using tape, um, which would just um, strap between the two elbow joints to prevent abduction. Be a little bit scary as far as creating a, a tourniquet. Um, you'd wanna be really careful with that, but if you could fashion something looking um, at that image, if you could fashion something that would do the same thing, um, then you know that would be that would not be unreasonable. All right, um, and so uh, with medial um, uh, lateral and multidirectional shoulder instability in dogs, there was a study that was done that looked at outcome on these patients. So medical management was associated with about seventy percent good to excellent outcome, which is not bad, um, particularly you know if we're thinking that the next step is going to be uh, arthroscopy and, and prosthetic ligament um, replacement, uh, which is gonna give us another 16% or 17% improvement. Medical management is actually not bad for these cases. In this study, 36% of animals that had medical management went on and had surgery. And uh, surgery uh, was associated with an improved outcome significantly over medical management, but recognizing that in order to do surgery on these guys, it's a big jump up in, in skill and equipment and stuff. I do have some videos on YouTube um, on scoping joints and also on the ligament replacement. If you're, you know, if you're a good uh, general practice surgeon, you could do a ligament replacement as long as you've got bone screws and stuff like that. It's not an easy surgery, but it is something that's certainly doable if you're comfortable, like if you're really comfortable doing TPLOs and bone plating and that kind of thing. It's something that you could, you know, that you could manage. Uh, question about laser shock therapy or any other mod modality. I don't know anything about those. My impression is that there's relatively limited uh, evidence-based uh, papers that have shown a benefit to them. I think that anecdotally, some people find them to be helpful. Um, I have not seen a lot of, of hardcore evidence based articles that have shown in a, you know, in a double blinded placebo controlled study that they, that they do a lot of good. Uh, the exception to that, I think that spinal cases with laser therapy, there was one study that showed that they did better. Um, so with medial shoulder instability, the key points that I wanna want you to remember are, number one, it's a common cause of lameness, which is relatively newly described 
and and a lot of people aren't aware of this as a as a disease um, and so if you're not aware of it you're not going to be able to diagnose it so just put it on the front of your radar for large breed dogs with four limb lameness which is exacerbated by exercise also remember with arthritis of the elbow joint that those dogs are usually going to get better with exercise whereas with a shoulder instability they're going to get worse with exercise it's uh, generally large in, in giant breed working dogs and it's a wear and tear injury. Um, it's a spectrum of disease going from mild to severe um, and that's based on clinical signs and it also dictates the type of treatment that we're gonna do and it can be a challenging, challenging diagnosis, especially if you're not looking for it. Okay, so really wait, raise your index of suspicion on that on large and giant breed dogs. Okay, um, what do you do with dirty margins after a soft tissue sarcoma surgery. Um, and so uh, dirty margins we know predict recurrence in a lot of cases. Um, I call this, this is when you're in surgery and you're cutting in and you realize that you've gotten a dirty margin during the surgery, I call that the oh shit phenomenon, where you realize during the procedure that you're not gonna get the tumor out as you expected. Um, so, there are four times when you recognize that you can't or didn't get it all before surgery, during the surgery, when histo results come back or when it recurs. This is with any cancer, not specific for soft tissue sarcomas, although uh, soft tissue sarcomas would be the one that I treat most commonly. And ideally, you wanna recognize that before you walk into theater that you're not gonna be able to get a clean margin because you wanna have that conversation with the owner before you get in there that, you're, unexpect, you're unlikely to be successful with the surgery. The next um, worst time, or the next best time, sorry, is during the surgery when you're cutting in and you realize that you cut into tumor. Um, the next is when histo results come back, but at least at that time you have an option to come back and do something which is going to reduce recurrence. And then when it recurs is obviously the worst case scenario. Um, so any one of those three is better than than when it comes back. All right, so with soft tissue sarcomas, we divide the issue into primary tumor and risk of secondary spread. Um, as far as secondary spread is concerned, it's grade dependent with grade ones having about 10% chance of metastasis, grade two is about 10%, grade three is about 50%. And note that chemotherapy does not prevent metastasis in dogs with soft tissue sarcomas either in dogs or in humans. Incidentally, in cats with injection site sarcomas, it does appear to reduce the risk of metastasis. As far as the primary tumor is concerned, we're gonna do a surgery. We're gonna check our surgical margins. The margins are clean. The risk of recurrence is about 5% in five years. If the margins are dirty, the risk of recurrence is about 75% in five years. So margins do predict local recurrence in soft tissue sarcomas and a lot of other tumor types. Okay, so what are our options? Let's say we've done an extremity soft tissue sarcoma and we get um, a dirty margin. Um, generally, if I just got a dirty margin, I would not amputate. Um, I would either treat the tumor site with ways that I'm gonna discuss in a minute, or I would wait and see what happens because extremity soft tissue sarcomas don't metastasize for the most part. I don't think I've ever seen one spread. Um, uh, recurrence, you can always amputate later on. And so um, I like rarely will I amputate a leg for a soft tissue sarcoma on an extremity unless the owners absolutely tell me, look, we've got one shot at this. I never want to see it again. Then, and they're happy to amputate. I'm happy to go ahead and do it. But usually I'm, I'm more likely to wait and see if that comes back. Remember that amputation um, is nearly universally accepted. Um, there was a study that was published in 1987, which is, what's that, 35 years ago, um, which showed that 98% of clients um, felt that their pet had a good to, excellent, good to excellent quality of life after an amputation. It doesn't matter how big they are, large giant breed dogs doesn't matter, they still do well. And so just because they're a large breed dog doesn't mean they can't have an amputation. If they have significant neurologic disease or orthopedic disease in another limb, that might be a suggestion that maybe amputation might not be a, a good option. But if you have a dog that can walk on four legs well, then it can walk on three legs well. 
All right, so what are our options? Um, the best would be to cut wider in the first place. So go back in time and do a bigger surgery. Obviously we can't go back in time, but going forward, be aggressive with these guys and get a clean margin on them. We did a study where we had 31 cases of extremity soft tissue sarcomas. We cut them all wide and left them all open to heal by second intention. So this, this incision healed by second intention. We had two out of 31 cases that required a, a skin graft. 29 out of 31 healed by second intention. And they, a lot of them were this big. Can we've gone in and taken out any brachial fascia, skin, and this was a 360 degree wound and that healed by second intention. So if that can heal by second intention, anything can. All right, so 31 cases, we got 100% clean margins. We got one recurrence, which we recut and now is tumor free, um, probably eight years on now. This is an older slide. All but two healed by second intention. So this is a surgery you don't need any special equipment for. Um, anybody can do it. It's just having the guts to do it. Um, with uh, re regards to time, this one took about 12 weeks to heal. So you're going to be doing bandage changes every three or four days until granulation tissue forms, and then about every five to seven days. All right, and this is much better than an amputation um, for these tumor types. All right. Um, the next option, so if you can't go back in time, um, the next option is going to be to recut it. And when you recut, you wanna treat the whole incision as if it's a brand new tumor. All right, so we're gonna get two to three centimeter margins around the entire incision. There was one study that was done at Colorado State. They had 41 cases recut, um, uh, recut after dirty margin soft tissue sarcoma, and they got a 15% recurrence rate. Um, mean, and, and compare that with a 75% recurrence rate if you didn't recut. Okay, so that's still a heap better. And that's better than you're gonna get with radiation therapy. Okay, so radiation, you're gonna get about a 20 to 25% recurrence rate. So if you leave it alone and wait and see, you're gonna get 75%. If you do radiation, you're gonna get about 20 to 25% recurrence. If you recut it, 15% recurrence, and honestly, my my recurrence rate after a recut is much better than that. I think it's probably about 2%. So if you're aggressive enough with your recut. Another question um, from Sonura, 11 year old Staffy, low grade soft tissue sarcoma removal with clean margins, nearly three months and having trouble with exuberant granulation tissue at the level of the carpal joint despite bandage with splint support. It's considering a skin graft uh, appropriate at this point, definitely. Yeah, so if you're three months down the road and it still hasn't healed, um, then skin graft is definitely the next, the next step. There are other things you can consider like a pouch graft or something like that, but a skin graft is certainly the easiest and the one that's associated with the best quality of life um, uh, uh, for the patient afterward. So skin graft definitely a consideration. And you can, Sonura, contact me directly. You know, you have my email address and stuff if you have, or if you need any advice on doing a skin graft. Also, we do have a YouTube video on skin grafting. Um, and we're working on a vet dojo module on skin grafting as well right now. So those of you who haven't seen vet dojo, it's www.vetdojo.com, which is our e-learning platform. Right now we have modules on uh, total ear canal ablation, toggle pinning for cox femoral luxation, femoral head neck ostectomy, medial patellar luxation, axial pattern flaps, and then we've got a subscription plan, which is basically all the intellectual, intellectual proper, property from Southpaws. So all of our standard operating procedures, job descriptions, descriptions of com, um, complications, all kinds of things. That's 15 bucks a month US. Um, and you'll get a huge amount of content for that. So just go and have a look um, at vetdojo.com. Uh, radiation therapy, again, is an option. Um, recurrence rate of 20 to 25% in five years, well tolerated in most pets. It does require 15 to 17 general anesthetic episodes, depending on where you go for the radiation. When you get it done here, it's, it's generally 15 to 17. We have fairly old technology. This is called orthovoltage. It's about 80 year old technology. This is a new machine from Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. Um, 
it's look, it's not the best radiation therapy in the world, but it's very effective for about 80 to 85% of patients that need radiation. Um, so it's just, it's a lot cheaper for us to run this than to get a linear accelerator, which is going to cost probably about 5 million, including the fit out. Um, you need four meters of high density concrete in the primary beam. Um, and so this thing, it's paid for, you know, we pay about $10,000 a year in quality assurance um, compared to a LINAC, which you're going to pay $5 million for your initial uh, purchase and fit out. Um, you're going to have to pay a radiation oncologist at about $250,000 a year. You have about $100,000 a year in quality, quality assurance. So it was just out of the realm of possibility for us. All right, so other consideration is metronomic chemotherapy, which is, again, as good as radiation therapy for incompletely excised soft tissue sarcomas. So metronomic chemotherapy is cyclophosphamide in peroxicam, and this is a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. I'm not sure how many of you have looked at these in the past, but basically this is the percentage of patients that are disease-free at the different time intervals. And so at time zero, we have 100% disease-free, and as these lines drop off, these are patients that have failed in that they have developed local recurrence. And then the triangles here are patients that are censored, meaning that they were either alive at the end of the study or had died of a different cause or an unrelated cause. And so good treatments have fairly horizontal slopes, whereas bad treatments have nearly vertical slopes. That's just a, a rough guide at how to look at a Kaplan-Meier survival curve. And so these are the metronomic chemotherapy patients. And so at the end of the study, only 20%, if you come across here, percent um, uh, disease-free. So only 20% had recurrence at about, what is this, 1,500 days is about four years, five years. Whereas untreated, they had virtually 100% recurrence in this particular study. And so cyclophosphamide and proxicam are two medications that you can administer in-house and you're gonna get as good a result as radiation therapy with um, uh, lifelong use. So this is gonna go on every day or every other day for life, cyclophosphamide and paroxicam. Now, for those of you that are thinking about doing metronomic chemotherapy, um, you can, there's a, there are a couple of different services. One is called um, www.thepetoncologist.com. And another one is called www.vetoncologyconsults.com. And they both are online telemedicine oncology consultation services. And they will give you the full protocol, when you need to do blood work, what to watch out for side effects. And they'll even provide abstracts and publications to support their, back, uh, their, um, uh, their recommendations. Those two are in Australia. Um, I'm sure that there are a ton of them in Europe and in the US that provide the same service. And so there's no reason why you can't do chemotherapy in your own practices. And these are just oral medications. Um, and you don't even have to, I mean, you have to wear gloves when you administer them, but they're not even that big a deal. Um, you know, paroxicam is just feldine. It's just non non-steroidal. Cyclophosphamide is a very low grade uh, chemotherapeutic drug. Uh, cyclophosphamide is 10 milligrams per meter squared every 24 hours. Paroxicam is 0.3 milligrams per kilogram every 24 hours. These recommendations are from the publication, but now they're doing every other day on these, and it's significantly reduced the, um, the complications that we see with it. So again, don't go based on this recommendation. This was from Robin Elmsley's original study. They are going out to 48 hours on these, but I would get uh, go under the direction of a medical oncologist if you're thinking about starting to do these. All you need is one consult for the first patient, and then you can apply what they've told you to other patients going forward. It is anti-endothelial and anti-angiogenic, which means that it's going to prevent new blood vessels from forming. Um, and so that's how it's, it has the anti-tumoral effect. Um, also, it increases anti-tumoral immunity. So that's how it works. All right, so 7% uh, of dogs had an increase in creatinine. Um, and that's probably going to be from thiboroxicam, which can be uh, nephrotoxic. And so you do, you do need to follow with blood work monthly um, for six months and then quarterly. 22% had anorexia and vomiting, which was abated by increasing the treatment interval to every other day. So that's why they've gone to every other day. 10% had severe hemorrhagic cystitis. And this is as bad as it sounds. So just really horrendous hemorrhage coming from the bladder. Um, 
seven, uh, seven out of 10 of these dogs resolved when they discontinued the medication, 3% were euthanized for the hemorrhagic cystitis. So it's not an ideal treatment, but if you're looking at almost certain recurrence for a soft tissue sarcoma, um, if you do nothing and they can't afford or you don't have access to radiation therapy, metronomic is definitely a consideration. Probably more of a consideration the older the dog it is because you know a five-year-old dog, you don't wanna be doing this medication every other day for the next 10 years. Whereas if it's already a 12 year old dog and you're only looking at two or three years to go, that's a much more palatable consideration. Okay, any questions about that? All right, so um, just uh, to uh, it, uh, display this information in a chart. Um, so if you wait and see after a dirty margin, it's 75% recurrence. Note that this applies to soft tissue sarcomas universally. On the extremity, they seem to be more benign and probably have a lower recurrence rate in five years, probably more like about 30% in five years with a marginal excision on the extremity compared to 75% overall. Obviously amputation, you're gonna have almost no recurrence, although it does happen at the amputation stump occasionally. Wide local excision is about 5% recurrence. Recutting is 15% recurrence, metronomics about 20% recurrence, and radiation is 20 to 25% recurrence. So that gives you an idea of all the spectrum of different things that we can, um, that we can do for dirty margins on soft tissue sarcomas, noting that all of these, all five of these, you can do in your own practices. The exception would be radiation therapy. All right, so, and as I said before, dirty margins do predict recurrence. So this was from my study um, that I published in 1996. So in dogs that had clean margins, we had one single recurrence um, at about a year out, whereas with dirty margins, we had ultimately about 75% recurrence at about, I think this is about five years. All right, um, wide local excision from the start is clearly your best option. Now this is the hind leg of a dog and what's missing here is all of the fascia lata and most of the biceps muscle, okay? I do this all the time and these dogs recover from surgery and are walking the next day on that leg with almost no limp. All right, so um, this is clearly the best option if you've got a soft tissue sarcoma, if you wanna prevent recurrence. And these dogs clinically do very well. It's possible that, you know, little Fifi, the Pomeranian would not be able to hunt wildlife on the savannas of Africa if it were in the wild, but um, when it's sitting on the sofa or in Paris Hilton's pocketbook, um, I think it's gonna survive just fine. All right, so first surgery is the best chance for a cure. All right, otherwise the horse is out of the um, out of the barn before you got a chance to close the door. All right, there are options to reduce recurrence following dirty margins. So recut, radiation therapy is over here, metronomic chemotherapy is over here. All right, so reconstructive surgery options, once you've done your wide local excision, um, there are great um, uh, flaps that are based around the inguinal or axillary folds. Um, the inguinal fold or the flank fold flap is the most robust flap that dogs have. I do these all the time. They're my, my number one favorite. Um, anything around the, the, the thigh or the lateral abdomen, use a flank fold flap. You just have a huge amount of very um, elastic skin that has probably three or four different blood vessels growing into it. So the risk of necrosis is much lower. So if there's a flap that you're thinking, you know, you're thinking about starting to do axial pattern flaps, the flank fold flap is definitely the best one to get into first. Um, it's technically easy um, and it's going to give you really great coverage for a lot of different areas. Um, so goals of reconstructive surgery are to obtain a closure with minimal tension, return to function of the injured area, and ensure that the outcome is free of, the, of morbidity, particularly in the donor site. So you don't want to borrow from Peter to pay Paul and leave Peter completely broke with a big dehist wound. All right, so um, you wanna be careful with your donor site as, as well as your recipient site. All right, so whenever we're doing cancer surgery, we're gonna follow Halstead's principles. 
careful tissue handling, meticulous hemostasis, preservation of blood supply, strict aseptic technique, minimum tension, accurate tissue apposition, obliteration of dead space. Notice that placing drains is nowhere in Halstead's principles. All right, so there are cases where you do need a drain, but, um, uh, but they are few and far between. Just a, by note of history, um, William Halstead um, was an amazing surgeon. Um, he also was a cocaine addict and a morphine addict. Um, he and his students, graduate students, all discovered cocaine as a local anesthetic and all got completely addicted to it. And so they decided to use morphine to get off of their cocaine habit and be became completely addicted to morphine. He was a highly functional cocaine and morphine addict, was doing brain surgery on people under the influence of cocaine and morphine. So interesting history. Um, the, the history of surgery is just fascinating. If you want recommendations for books to read um, on the history of surgery, there's just some really, really great um, personal stories, personal triumphs, things like that. And again, if you're interested, send me an email. All right, so tension. If you can't close without tension, think of another plan. Tension is really bad for, um, for closure. Excessive tension causes ischemia in the skin edges. I'd rather leave something open to heal by second intention than close with tension. All right, it, it delays and inhibits wound healing. Um, sutures cut through the skin and you get dehiscence. And the other thing here is that we've got a foreign body in the form of a Penrose drain. Um, there's no indication for Penrose drains in my uh, personal opinion in cancer surgery. Just throw them out, do not use them. You don't need to drain these patients. Who cares if you get a seroma? It's uncommon. If you do, big deal. You do not want to use drains in these cases. Number one, it increases the risk of infection. Number two, you're creating a foreign body in the wound. Number three, your drain holes are contaminated with cancer cells if you've got dirty margins. Seriously, gather up all of your Penrose drains in your practice and throw them in the bin. All right, there's a question. If there are dirty margins, does closing with a flap cause a disaster when it comes to second surgery due to potential for a very wide spread? Yes. So we're only gonna do reconstruction once we're confident we've gotten clean margins. And interestingly, there was a study done in human medicine where with experienced surgeons, their perception of the completeness of surgical margins was as good as histological um, margins in predicting recurrence. So when you do a surgery, if you're really confident that you've gotten the whole thing out, you probably did. If you're in surgery and you think, oh, I'm not so sure, or I don't think I, you know, I, I, I was afraid I couldn't close it, so I didn't take out as much as I wanted to, blah, 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 blah. That is going to be a dirty margin and it's going to come back. So if you have any concerns about your, have got your, your completeness of surgical margins during the surgery, don't do reconstruction. Wait for your margins to come back from the pathologist. And then if you get a dirty margin, um, you, you can then at that time do a reconstructive procedure because you're not then your donor site and your, and your recipient site are not gonna be connected by the same surgical instruments and incision and stuff like that. But your, you know, your best option is if you've gotten dirty margins and you've left it open to heal by second intention, come back and do something straight away um, to resolve that, um, that, dirty, that dirty margin. All right, so um, in veterinary medicine, in human medicine, you have the luxury of having the resection team and the reconstruction team. And so particularly with human maxillofacial stuff, the resection team will come in, take out everything that they need to, and then the reconstruction team will walk in, the resection team will walk out, and, and the reconstruction team will put everything together um, and close it using the tissues that they have available. And these two teams are working in opposite directions. The resection team's trying to get everything out they need to in order to get a clean margin. The reconstruction team wishes that the the cancer surgery was very limited so they'd have more tissues to work with. And so they're kind of diabolically opposed. We don't have that luxury in veterinary medicine. And so you have to divide your brain into the resection team and reconstruction team. With the resection team, you take out everything that you need to in order to get a clean margin. And then, um, and then turn over your brain to the other side and start thinking about how you're gonna put it together. But don't let these two mix or else you're gonna leave cancer behind because you're worried about how you're gonna close it. 
So think about your reconstruction plans before you walk into theater. Then when you start cutting, forget about reconstruction, just get everything out that you need to. And then when the tumor's all out and you're confident you've gotten clean margins, then think about how you're gonna close it. So um, for example, if I didn't do that, I wouldn't be able to do a surgery that looks like this. So this is an injection site sarcoma in a cat. We've taken out nine ribs, um, part of the diaphragm. Uh, we did put a polypropylene mesh in here. And luckily cats have two cats worth of skin. So I was able to close this without significant tension. Also cat skin can handle tension better than dog skin. Um, and so again, if I were worried about how I was gonna close it, I wouldn't be able to do something like this. All right, so regarding timing of reconstruction, you only wanna do your recon once you're confident that you've gotten clean margins. Don't use a flap if the margins are dirty. One thing that you can do is harvest your flap before you remove your tumor. So harvest your flap, close the donor site. You have your flap sitting out here, then go and cut the tumor out because then your donor site is not gonna be contaminated with cancer cells if you get a dirty margin. And then also consider a delayed closure if you're not sure about your margins. Um, so for delayed closure, you can do a tie over dressing, something like this where you do loops of suture within the skin and then lay um, a non-inherent bandage onto the wound and then go lap sponges or whatever on top and then just tie over that. Also vacuum assisted closure um, is beyond the scope of this discussion, but is very, very good for helping form granulation tissue in patients with large open wounds. All right, so um, what makes a, an axial pattern flap compared to a subdermal plexus flap? Axial pattern flap has a direct cutaneous artery and vein supplying the whole flap. So that's the big difference is if it has a direct cutaneous artery and vein intact. Um, otherwise it's just a random or subdermal plexus flap. And axial pattern flaps survive to a much, much greater extent than random flaps. All right, so when you're doing an axillary or inguinal fold flap, probably the most, it's the most robust and versatile flap for trunk and proximal limb wounds. Remember that when you look at the flank fold, it basically has four margins. One, two, three, four. Does that make sense to everybody? All right, so basically with a flank fold flap or an axillary fold flap, we're cutting three of those four margins and leaving one margin intact. And that's gonna be our bridge between our flap and our recipient site. Does that make sense to everybody? Dylan, you're, you're my barometer, yeah. All right, so an inguinal fold flap, uh, what we're doing is we've got a big open wound here and I'm taking this flank fold from the front of the thigh. And so I'm gonna cut this margin, this margin, the margin on the other side of the thigh and I'm gonna keep this margin on the other side of the flap intact and I'm gonna bring it up and close that defect. All right, so you can see that I've cut one, two, three margins and I've kept one margin intact, bring that up and close that defect. Once you actually do one, it's a lot easier to conceptualize. All right, so here's another example. I think this is actually the same patient. Yeah, so I've taken the flap from the front of the thigh and I'm, I've brought it up here and it's a very wide based, very robust flap. The skin is, is robust and, um, and um, thick. Uh, if you take it from the ventral abdomen, sometimes it'll be hairless, just to be aware. Here's another case, some massive tumor resection here. We've taken a flap off the front of the leg there and we're bringing it up. So big flap harvest here. We're bringing it up and closing that defect there. My favorite flap. Um, so when we've got a wound on the lateral thorax, what options do we have available? Um, so this is a big wound that we're creating and you'll find also that when you plan your surgical wound and then you actually make your skin incision, the wound expands by double um, just because the, the elasticity of the skin. Um, so We've taken out, we've gotten our clean margins here. We're down to chest wall, taken out abdominal wall here. We've closed the abdominal wall primarily, taken a flank fold flap off the front of the thigh. I mean, who would have thought that a flank fold flap could close that big defect? Well, look at that. 
It's just massive and elastic and works really, really well. And this is one because of the size of the defect, I did put in a closed suction drain. If you are going to drain something, please use closed suction. So here's one um, that's on the forelimb. So this is the elbow here. So I'm harvesting an axillary fold flap. So same principles apply. And that's what it looks like. You can do it bilaterally. So if you've got like mammary gland tumors that you're removing caudally, here you can harvest two flank fold flaps, one from either side. So you can see our incisions here and here and pull them together and cover huge defects um, on the ventral abdomen. All right, so um, tips and tricks for, for reconstruction. You want to clip big, measure the distance to cover, make sure you take cutaneous trunk eye, plan your closure. You may or may not use a drain in these depending on the size of your defect and be careful with bandages because you don't want to create a tourniquet um, uh, effect with your bandage. I, I often do not use bandages on these. All right, note and drain, don't put them through the base of the flap if you're going to use them because you could damage the blood vessel. Use a septic technique when you're handling the drain after surgery. Generally used for larger flaps. It says here you can use them for all. My general rule of thumb is unless you absolutely need a flap, to, uh, a drain, don't use it and leave the drain in for three to five days. And what that's going to do is if you're going to do it, Again, closed suction drain, not a Penrose drain. That suction is gonna cause the flap to, to adhere down to the underlying bed and form um, a fibrin seal. Um, so again, you don't need them in most cases. I've gone away from using drains in most flaps, but um, if you're gonna use one, use a closed suction drain. All right, what are complications with flaps? Um, infection, seroma, skin edge dehiscence and necrosis. Um, those are the big ones that we see. Um, skin edge dehiscence and necrosis is due to a compromised blood supply. Um, that can be due to tension, maybe aggressive tissue handling, previous surgical attempts where you've damaged the blood supply before you ever, ever got in there, surgical trauma or systemic disease like diabetes. Um, at this point, looking at this flap right here, I would probably wait a few days before I admitted defeat on this one. Okay, this one may, we, you, we may still get partial thickness survival of that flap. This is a genicular axial pattern flap from the front of the thigh that then is being used to close a defect on the, um, uh, the cranial aspect of the tibia. That's the calcaneus down there. All right, so skin edge dehiscence. Um, this was a deep circumflex iliac dorsal branch flap, and it was closed under a bit of tension, and so it dehissed all the way around the outside. What would I do with this? Uh, oh, that's the anus back here. Um, what would I do with this? I would just let it heal by second intention. And what we do is have owners just run tap water over it, um, uh, either tap, either a garden hose or in the shower or something like that. Do that twice a day um, for a couple of weeks, and you'll see that they will go on and heal completely often. All right, you, um, you may see um, discoloration 12 hours after surgery of this flap. So this is a, a genicular flap coming around the front of the tibia. And you can see that that's turning purple. That would be somewhat concerning to me. I certainly wouldn't debride it at this point, but that would be an indication that, that we might get necrosis later on. If you have vac or vacuum assisted closure, it would be a really good idea to apply it to this flap at this point, because you can salvage some of these flaps. Um, indications for draining seromas that do form, I don't drain them, basically. I mean, unless they're causing a big problem, I just leave them alone. They will absorb over time. Um, so usually they declare themselves at two or three days. Um, the SR may not come off for a number of weeks. There's nothing wrong with, wrong with just leaving that alone and letting it fully declare itself. If it's absolutely necrotic, sometimes I'll go in and debride it um, uh, just to try to accelerate wound healing, but 
that eschar actually forms a nice bandage to protect the wound underneath. Now, um, can I get a, let me just go back to gallery. Um, can I get a thumbs up? We're running over, but I've got some more stuff to talk about. Do you want me to keep going? Thumbs up if you want me to keep going. Okay, great. All right, so we'll keep going for a little while. I've got some stuff to do, but I'll, I'll keep, um, keep plugging along. Um, so this was the, the wound that necrosed. And so we just let that heal by second intention. All right, so what can we do to improve flat viability? Halstead's principle, um, planning of the flat beforehand, careful skin manipulation, and then vac or vacuum assisted closure can be a benefit as well. And if you have suction in your practice, you can fashion your own vacuum assisted closure. Um, it does, you don't have to buy the unit. Um, just note that if you are using a conventional suction unit that you use for your abdomens, um, that may have a duty cycle. And if you keep that running all night, um, you may burn it out. So just be aware of that. All right, so managing questionable flaps. Um, you can try releasing tensin, tension, uh, manage systemic uh, issues, hyperbaric auction and maybe a benefit. I don't know a lot of people that have that available and then vacuum assisted closure. With vacuum assisted closure, basically what we're doing is we are um, putting a non-adherent or foam uh, contact layer and then covering everything with Iaban with a, pen, with a um, closed suction drain inside. And then we're applying about 80 to 100 millimeters of mercury negative pressure. And that by um, doing vacuum assisted closure, um, let me just see if I've got it. No. Um, uh, you in, enhance granulation tissue, you uh, fight infection. It's also analgesic, incidentally, dogs seem to like it. So um, negative pressure is applied to the wound. You can see a big wound that we've got here in this dog. And then we've got this foam that's applied to the, the wound. And then we've got this suction that's inside the um, Iaban or Opsite that's applied. And then we apply suction to it for like three days straight. And you'll see that the wound actually sucks down in size, more granulation tissue, antibacterial, um, all kinds of great benefits associated with that. So if you want more information on that, you can certainly let me know um, and I can talk to you about how to fashion your own ones, uh, ones of these. All right, so we'll do a quick update on stifle disease um, and then we will um, wrap it up for the day. All right, so we've got several truths um, that we can, um, we can count on and take to the bank. Number one, cruciate disease is the most common cause of hindland lameness in dogs. Everybody agree with that? Thumbs up? All right. Meniscal injury is a cause of recurrent lame, lameness following cru cruciate repair. Everybody agree with that? Okay. Bilateral disease is common and radiographic changes can predict contralateral rupture. Everybody got that? All right. Most likely true. Most dogs require surgery. So you're gonna get a better outcome in dogs with surgery than with conservative management. Tibial osteotomy procedures recover more completely and more quickly than extracapsular stabilization procedures. The meniscus should be evaluated during surgery. And I would, I would almost put this on the absolutely true. Um, category. You really need to be looking at your meniscus because if you, number one, meniscal injury occurs in about 50% of patients at the time of the initial diagnosis. And number two, if you don't fix the meniscus, they're not going to do well. And you're going to think that it's your cruciate repair failing when in fact it was the pre-existing meniscal disease. And physiotherapy after surgery accelerates recovery following cruciate repair. So the definite, definite truths again, cruciate disease is the most common cause of hind limb lameness. Meniscal injury is a cause of recurrent lameness following cruciate repair. Bilateral disease is common and radiographic changes can predict contralateral um, rupture. Most likely, most dogs require surgery. Tibial osteotomy procedures are better than extracapsular stabilization. Meniscus should be evaluated during surgery. Physiotherapy after surgery accelerates recovery. Okay, and I, you know, the, these four, I pretty much treat as, as gospel truth as well um, and, and the way that I manage my cruciate disease. All right, so looking at the knee from the top, 
we've got the um, meniscus um, laterally and medially. Note that the um, lateral meniscus, both meniscotibial ligaments, so, sorry, there are meniscotibial ligaments both medially and, sorry, and I may be incorrect here. Um, I might have gotten mixed up here. So the medial meniscus, which is over here, it looks like a fabella there, but medial meniscus, we've got um, meniscotibial ligaments cranially and caudally, whereas lateral meniscus, you have a cranial meniscal tibial ligament and the caudal ligament actually attaches to the femur. So that when you run through a range of motion, the lateral meniscus moves with the femur, whereas the medial meniscus is firmly affixed to the tibial plateau and that's why it's more likely to tear. We've got several different types of tear of the meniscus, a longitudinal tear, which ultimately can look like a bucket handle. We've got radial tears, we've got horizontal tears and oblique tears. So what are the controversies? Um, meniscal release is a big one. Um, the reason, so what people do is they go in and they cut the caudal meniscal tibial ligament with the idea that it's gonna make the medial meniscus behave more like a lateral meniscus. And that is going to prevent meniscal injury down the road. So medial meniscal release probably reduces the incidence of meniscal injury. It does result in changes in contact biomechanics and meniscal release incites severe arthritis. Generally, meniscal release is no longer appropriate with cruciate disease. So I would rather diagnose it and treat it, treat meniscal injury when it happens, make sure I look at the meniscus when I go in, but I don't believe that meniscal release is appropriate. That is controversial, but that's my opinion. Um, so medial meniscus, 30 to 50% of dogs have meniscal injury at the time of surgery and undiagnosed meniscal injury can cause persistent lameness following surgery. Probing the medial meniscus during surgery reduces the chance of missing an injury. So in my opinion, you need to look at the meniscus in every case. If you can't see the meniscus, that's not an excuse not to look for it. You need to improve your technique so that you can see the meniscus. I've had people that have come in to me and said, oh, I don't bother looking because I can never see it very, very, very well. Well, fix your technique so that you can see it. Because it's, you know, if 30 to 50% of dogs have a meniscal injury at the time of surgery, and you miss that, that means that that dog is not gonna do well after your surgery, and you're gonna blame yourself when you should be blaming the medial meniscus that was ruptured beforehand. So you definitely need to look at that. All right, now if you are doing extra capsular sutures, so say you're not doing a tibial osteotomy uh, uh, repair, and you are doing extra capsular sutures, um, there are such things, well, there's isometric points, and what isometric points are, are points between two bones that are rotating around each other where the distance between those two points stays, stays constant throughout range of motion. And if you could anchor your suture at those sites, ideally that's gonna reduce um, the tension on the extracapsular suture and improve your success. Unfortunately in the stifle, there's no such thing as a perfectly isometric point, but just caudal to the extensor groove is pretty close, okay? So either um, if you're going around the fabella, the place that you should be putting your, um, your suture is pretty much right here. And I know a lot of people go all the way down here with their sutures, that makes no sense because the, the um, cranial cruciate runs in this direction in the normal animal. Why are you gonna anchor your suture here and down here, you can see that your cranial drawer is almost perpendicular to the line of tension of the suture. Just crazy. Don't put your suture all the way down here. You need to be putting it right up here, right underneath the tibial plateau. Okay, that also means that your suture is gonna be shorter, which means that elasticity of the suture is gonna be less of an issue. So elasticity of three centimeters of suture plays less of an impact than six centimeters of suture. Does that make sense? So, so T2 right up here, just either right in front of or right behind um, the long digital extensor tendon. And generally I go in T2 right up here. Um, 
Ligofiba is the stiffest suture. That's not absolutely necessarily a good thing, but it is stiff. And so if you're looking for something that does not have a lot of flex as it runs through range of motion, ligofiba is better than fishing line. All right, so if you have excessive tension, you can alter contact biomechanics and actually squish the meniscus. And so you don't want these so tight that you can't even move the leg through range of motion. You can do a little bit, uh, uh, just, just tie it finger tight, you know, fairly snug, but not, um, uh, not so tight that, that you know, you're, you know, you're pulling on both ends of the, the suture with all your might um, before you tie that knot. You want it to be a little bit more loose than that. There's a question about um, when you notice a bucket handle tear on arthrotomy, the only, yeah, so question, do you only deal with the tear or do you take the whole meniscus out? You want to preserve as much of the meniscus as possible and just remove the torn or damaged part of the meniscus. Um, and then there's a question about what about tightrope extra capsule technique and suture? I assume that you mean, is that as good as a tibial osteotomy? I think tightrope's better, but I still think tibial osteotomy, there's nothing that beats it um, when you look at the literature as far as outcome is concerned. Icing is good after cranial cruciate ligament rupture. And so we ice all of our patients. We encourage your owners to ice um, the knees as well for about three days after surgery. If you or I had knee surgery, we would be icing ours. We should be nice icing our, our veterinary patients as well. And they actually quite like it. Um, they tolerate it really well. Um, don't know why I jumped in there. Let's see. All right, so we'll leave it at that. Um, and I'll end my, stop sharing. Can come up here. All right, so um, are there any questions at the po this point from anything? So there's a question, does partial cruciate ligament rupture need TPLO, which is more seen in grade three MPL in dogs two to three years of age? Partial cruciate rupture need TPLO. I'm not sure I understand the question. Can you, can you restate that? Um, and we do TPLOs now on even like five kilogram dogs. We do them in cats now. I think that the outcome is so much better than extra capsular sutures. Um, so, but if you're gonna do an extra capsular suture, make sure that you place your suture anchor points quite high up in the tibia um, so that you're gonna get better reduction in, in cranial tibial thrust and cranial draw. Any other questions? All right, well, we'll leave it at that. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, hopefully I'll be able to start doing these. I don't know that I'll do them every other week like I used to, but I hope to get back to some kind of regularity. So um, question is, if dogs having grade three medial patelloxation have increased cranial tubule thrust? Um, I'm not sure that I have an answer to that question. Um, there is a um, TPLO which addresses medial patellar luxation as well. I haven't done a lot of them, but you can just shift that um, the uh, tibial segment laterally so that you're shifting the tibial crest laterally as if you're doing a tibial crest transposition. Um, there's a comment here. There was a paper on cruciate repairing dogs where they did not do an arthrotomy and only 7% had post-operative issues. Mm -hmm. Only a small percentage had revision surgery. So um, I... That is one paper, and I understand that that is that was the findings of those paper of that paper. But there are a million other papers out there that say that medial meniscal injury is a significant issue down the road um, in a much larger percentage of patients. And I wonder about the sensitivity of their diagnosis of meniscal injury. For example, with TTA surgeries, there was one study that showed that forty percent of those dogs are going to have meniscal injury down the road. Um, so I think that there's just a disparity in in observation and outcome with different papers, but the majority of papers definitely support the idea that um, meniscal injury is, is a significant complication going down the road. And I, you know, we, we see about probably 10% meniscal injury with TPLO, something like that down the road. And if we're, you know, TPLO has the lowest risk of meniscal injury um, compared with any other procedure, and we still see six to 10%. Um, that means that with other procedures, you are most certainly 
um, having meniscal injury and potentially missing them um, and resulting in a poor outcome. Any other questions or comments? I'll wait around for just a minute. <laughs> we have a comment from Elizabeth. Elizabeth, where are you uh, located? Um, she missed sleep to join in. Where are you watching from? Germany. Great. So it would be middle of the night there. Um, well, thank you very much, much for making the effort. Um, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you again soon. All right. I'm going to leave it at that. Thanks again for watching and hope to see you soon.